Hi, I'm Los Angeles County Supervisor Don Kanabi. I'm pleased to welcome you back to another episode of Dialed In. Los Angeles County is made up of 88 cities and over 140 unincorporated areas, each with their own issues that require local, state, and federal level involvement. 18 members of Congress represent districts here in Los Angeles County, and it's important that we work together to benefit all of our residents and constituents. This month, I'm excited to welcome back to the show Congressman Ed Royce, who represents the 39th District here in California. His district includes Hacienda Heights, Roland Heights, Diamond Bar, and parts of Orange and San Bernardino counties. Since first being elected to Congress in 1993, Congressman Royce has worked to address the national debt, fight the exploitation of children, and spur job creation. He is chairman of the very powerful House Committee on Foreign Affairs and also a senior member of the House Committee on Financial Services. Today, We'll talk to the congressman about what's happening in D.C. and the issues he's working on here in Los Angeles County. I hope you enjoy the show. When Dennis Walker was in high school, his locker partner, Dave, stole his girlfriend. And Dennis realized Dave was not his friend. When Dennis got satellite, he also got an unreliable signal. And he realized satellite was not his friend. Now he has charter and a reliable weatherproof signal, just like thousands of others who switch every month. Take it from Dennis. Satellite is not your friend. Get a reliable signal, rain or shine, with charter. Welcome back to Dial In. As the chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Congressman Royce has been a major player in our country's international policies. From the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East to Ukraine, Russia to North Korea, he's been heavily involved internationally on behalf of the United States of America. Welcome back to the show, Congressman. Don, good to be with you, thanks. Well, let's see, let's start. Let's, I think you've been in Congress now for 20 years? Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Any significant changes? Well, you know, Other than the polling the numbers? Before I got to Congress, uh, one, of the, one of the things you would see is more, I think, cooperation. Tip O'Neill, for example, was the leader in the Senate of the Democrats, and Ronald Reagan back then was the president. But you noticed how they found a way to come together on common ground in order to do work in a bipartisan way for the good of the country. One of the things I've tried to do on the Foreign Affairs Committee is to bring both sides of the aisle together to work in tandem. And I think we've done a good job of passing bipartisan legislation. Um, and I, that's one of the things I want to do. I keep reminding members of the days when Reagan and Tip O'Neill worked together, we need to have those kinds of relationships today because there's a lot of work to be done. We're all in this together and we face some very th serious challenges overseas. And it, it appears, at least to the public, and even yeah. though I'm sort of an insider outsider, right. uh, that it's more challenging and more difficult to get things done together. It, it, it has been. Uh, there's a ranking that is done by GovTrack in terms of members of Congress. I have the highest percentage of legislation, authored legislation, in which my uh, co-author is a, a Democratic member. So what I try to do is to sort of combine and work on the legislation early with members on both sides of the aisle to get that consensus, then introduce it, and then move it into the Senate. Well, I think yours is one of the few committees where bipartisan efforts are coming out of. I, yeah. I do remember the old days. I remember going back there and, and you and Jerry Lewis and oh, Lucia yeah. Roy Bar Allard, you guys would convene Right. both sides of the aisle together, and we'd have a, a meeting of all members to make sure that we were moving forward on legislation, not only affecting Southern California, but the state as well, too, so. Right, we have some big challenges, and, and what we do in D.C. can really impact California. Absolutely, We've got to do big it together. time, even though we're so far away. And you have to put up with that, what, a, a, ABC, anybody but California kind of a thing, so. Well, as Chairman of Foreign Affairs, I mean, obviously you mentioned some of the bipartisan issues, but. Uh, maybe give us an idea how that committee sort of interacts or is involved in crafting uh, some of our international policy. Let me give you some examples. For example, we um, embassy security, making certain that we do the oversight overseas. Uh, we've got an embassy security bill that I authored that is now over in the Senate in order to better protect our personnel in the State Department. We have the responsibility of oversight over the administration on foreign policy, which is an ongoing um, um, you know, requirement uh, uh, with, the hearings, with the hearings, with the hearings with the Secretary of State, you know, and with the, with the executives. Head of USAID, for example, will be testifying soon. We have the um, 
uh, we have the responsibility with international broadcasting. And we've got a bill right now that I and Ellie Engel have authored that's passed into the Senate to overhaul the way in which we broadcast into countries like Russia, um, trying again to do back what we did with Radio Free Asia, Radio Liberty, or Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, where we broadcast into countries where they don't have a chance to hear other viewpoints and sort of uh, move those countries away from a more confrontational approach to the United States, but instead bring up the next generation with uh, a better understanding of our positions. We're doing that broadcasting, of course, also in China and also now in the Middle East. We're going to overhaul that. So uh, I'm, I'm, on, uh, I'm soon traveling to the Middle East. Uh, I'll be there to uh, have meetings on some of the ongoing problems there, but conflict resolution is part of our responsibility. I was recently in the eastern Ukraine and western Ukraine speaking with the Russian faction and with the uh, Western faction. Uh, Poroshenko, the new president, is trying to bring Ukraine together. And increasingly, you find Ukrainians in both factions saying, it's time for the Russians to butt out. And uh, that's a decision for them to come to, but he's obviously pulling the country together. Uh, we, can, we can assist in that. <clears throat> Well, you have, you're one of those rare members, because uh, a lot of folks are retiring, that was pre-9-11 and post-9-11. How has the role either of Congress or particularly your committee changed since the events and tragedies of, of September 11th? You know, it's interesting. I think it was only on our committee that we were sort of monitoring what was going on in Afghanistan pre-9-11. And pre-9-11, we had uh, terrorist training camps that uh, we were worried about that were being used by Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda, specifically with the consent of the Taliban, was preparing attacks. It turns out an attack on our homeland. One, yeah. of the, one of the things I remember is a hearing I did with a professor, Hassan Nouri, from, originally from the University of Kabul, uh, warning us um, about these camps and me saying, you know, there'd been one attack on the World Trade Center. If we're not careful, there'll be a second one. He called me the day of the attack to say, you know, in our hearings, this actually came up. The fact that there was sanctuary there, with sanctuary they could plan for the attack, and that diplomatically and with pressure we should have been doing more to resist that. Well, I think post 9-11 the big change is now the understanding that if somebody's using a training camp and is using sanctuary to train, as right now ISIS is doing, uh, you, you don't want them to be able to use that sanctuary in order to fully vet and train a force from outside that region uh, to come in and attack. And this is something that Great Britain and the United States and Australia are all very worried about because we have foreign fighters over there training in that camp right now. Many have suggested we should eliminate that camp. And certainly if the president makes that decision, he has the support of our committee to take out the terrorist training camp where ISIL is, is preparing uh, in that terrorist training. Well, the events recently uh, right. with ISIS mm -hmm. uh, and the issues going on, I mean, what, what do we really need to know? I mean, you've got a, sort of a, a combined effort over there that, that I always think is, and I always tell people from my days in the Homeland Security Commission, yeah. hey folks, there's a whole bunch of folks out there still don't like us, inbred here, but yeah. the issues, you know, uh, Syria, Iraq, and ISIS. What do we need to know about that? Well, I think ISIS is the, is the problem we're focused on because that particular organization, those foreign fighters, 5,000 of them are from countries such as in Europe, Australia, the United States, Chechnya. They've come from outside the region to go there with this commitment to a caliphate, a worldwide caliphate as they call for. And because they have passports from their home country, you now have this situation, you know, where you have 1,000 people from Britain uh, walking around with British passports, or 150 from Australia, who could go back to those home countries and carry out the attacks that their leader has called for. And for that reason, there is this renewed interest in what could we do to suppress ISIL. And, you know, you have in the region fighters like the Kurdish forces. If we give them the equipment that they say they need, you know, the anti-tank missiles, the artillery they need, um, they could do a very good job on the ground. We don't want to see U.S. boots on the ground, troops anywhere in that region. But, you know, in terms of drone flights, an armed drone that would go over, you know, their training base and 
go down and knock out uh, these Chechnyans who are, who are training the foreign fighters and eliminate that threat, uh, that's something that we're very much uh, focused on. Well, obviously, there's a lot going on in the world, a lot of international conflicts, but I know you also have a history of interest of issues in Africa. And I know that this <coughs> Ebola outbreak and some other issues, what is the role of your committee or you in particular uh, as it relates to these kinds of issues? You know, I, I talked with President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She's the first uh, woman president in Af of an African country and uh, in, in Liberia. The problem in West Africa, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, uh, in Guinea, is that we have a situation where you have an Ebola outbreak that is very severe. So what the CDC here in the United States has done is to put 60 of their experts, the Center for Disease Control, have their experts on the ground uh, watching the airports in West Africa to be able to check anyone coming on to a flight to see if there's any symptoms. Uh, this is a great concern we have is, you know, not having flights uh, come into the United States of people that might have Ebola. At the same time, we are also getting the equipment in because the number one thing that they need on the ground and groups like Doctors Without Borders need is the type of equipment that would allow you to isolate anyone with Ebola, treat them, and then if there's a corpse, properly handle the disposal of that corpse. So a lot of effort right now in the CDC is going into how to contain this, how to treat it, how to come up with an antidote for it. And um, uh, the, the, the key here is not to allow it to spread out of West Africa. A lot going on. I mean, guns and germs and all kinds of things uh, internationally that could potentially impact the United States as well. You're also a ranking member on the uh, House Committee on Financial Services. What yes. kinds of issues do you well, deal with there? on financial services, one of the things we're very concerned about is, is to try to get the economy, you know, up and running again. What can be done in terms of making sure that there's access to credit out there, to make sure that uh, you have for small business the ability to obtain loans, to get that, to get that extension of credit. You've seen the situation out here where many uh, many businesses with performing assets still weren't able to roll over that line of credit still were not able you know to access uh, that loan to expand and so uh, on behalf of our constituents and uh, on economic growth we want to make sure that that sector is working well and at the same time we want to make certain that any institutions that are too big to fail are either broken up or properly regulated to make certain that those institutions are controlled. Because we hear a lot of conversation about too big to fail. Right. But so there is conversation if they're too, if you feel that it's too big to fail, you're going to look at possibly breaking them up. That, that is correct. Because you're starting to see movement back of people coming together again, which makes everyone yeah. nervous. And that what we really want to see is health and strength in the community banks, because the community banks are the solution. They were never the problem. The problem were the big investment banks that were over leveraged. So one of the requirements is you've got to control leverage. You can't let them leverage it more than 10 to 1. And the second thing you want to do is everything you can do to assist the community banks in extending credit and allowing bankers to be bankers. Remember, they didn't get us into this, and they're part of the solution. Community banks and credit unions are part of the solution to get the local economy up and running again and help provide the access to credit to create those jobs. And particularly some of the bigger banks and bigger homes were the ones that leveraged the smaller community banks, and those were the ones that the way they got pinched out. So. Precisely. Well, look, we're going to come back and we're going to move it a west okay. to our, our backyards and the issues that you confront and I confront and how we're working together on those. And uh, so I appreciate that. The good, quick knowledge overview of a lot of turmoil and, you know, around the world, and you're right in the middle of it. And I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, We'll Tom. be right back. When Connie Andrews got married, her maid of honor, Caitlin, made some unauthorized alterations to her dress, and Connie realized Caitlin was not her friend. When Connie got Satellite, she joined the millions who don't get true on demand, and she realized Satellite was not her friend. Now Connie has Charter, with over 10,000 titles, many free. It's the on-demand she always wanted. Take it from Connie, Satellite is not your friend. Watch over 10,000 titles on demand with Charter. Hi, welcome back to Dial In. We're back here with uh, Congressman Ed Royce, 
39th Congressional District, Chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, also a senior member of the Committee on Financial Services. Congressman, we've talked uh, a lot about international matters, and so I'm going to try to see some of the issues that we're facing here locally. Uh, you and I have worked very closely together on an issue that we both have found so horrific right here in our own backyard, but not just here in Southern California, but throughout the nation, and that's you know, the issue of child sex trafficking. And let me first say I appreciate you allowing me to testify on the issue in front of your committee. I mean, that was an honor, but I think uh, we were able to raise the issue to a level that it hasn't been before. And, and as you and I have talked, you know, most people think this is something in some third world countries instead of our own backyards. You've had some, uh, with your ability at, as the chair of the committee, and, and uh, you have really, I think, helped, and I personally want to say thank you, having the federal government finally really take notice of this. Uh, one of your members, Congressman Poe, has been on the international piece. Uh, you've really seen, had some legislation that's been very important on child sex traffic, and maybe you can explain to the folks what that's all about. Well, I'll, I'll share that with you, Don, and uh, let me thank you again, not just for testifying, but for your leadership, the Board of Supervisors here in L.A. County. This has become sort of the template on how you approach this, but also your work statewide in that ballot initiative, because in that ballot initiative, by California passing an initiative that keeps the focus on the gangs and the, and the pimps that are running these criminal syndicates, uh, we allow for the first time kind of an intervention early on. Early on. As you testified before our committee, uh, you said, well, you have a, a circumstance where increasing the, the, these girls that are being recruited are 13 years of age. And that's the same thing we heard from prosecutors uh, in Orange County when they, when they testified at our hearing out here. 13 years of age. And these are coming increasingly from across the United States. These girls are recruited by these Romeo pimps. And the next thing you know, they're in the hands of some criminal gang. Our legislation that we pass as the federal component of this um, first looks at the record of anybody convicted of child sexual abuse and makes sure they're not going overseas. At the same time, you know, they're not going to Thailand because you, you know what they're going to be doing there. At the same time, we look at the records overseas of anybody who seeks to come here to have a record like that. We put pressure on governments overseas now. We have a special bureau that leans on those governments and ranks those governments on whether or not they're passing laws like the laws we're passing here to break up the criminal syndicates that abuse these underage girls or that go after trafficking, you know, labor trafficking issues. So we have a series of bills we've put into the Senate, and I'm still working on a, a third piece of legislation, an additional piece of legislation here, that will try to give the worker the information up front so that he or she knows just what job you're going to be getting. And a 1-800 number to call if it turns out that it's not the job you were told you were going to get, if it looks like you're being put into servitude, and, and specially trains in the U.S. out of the Department of Labor and other agencies and prosecutors to handle these cases so that we, we nip this thing in the bud. Well, we're, you're working with the Department of Homeland Security is involved yeah. with their blue program and other kinds of programs. I mean, one of the big issues is us, it's much better for us here, particularly in California, here in the county, to make it a federal issue versus a state issue. Right. Because at least at the federal level, uh, the scumbag pimps yeah. are spending 90% of their time in, in, in federal prison. Right. Whereas, you know, we got the release issues here, Prop 109 right. here in the state of California. We've recently had a, a very successful uh, package of bills come through the legislature that, you know, the, waiting for the governor to sign, he signed some of them, you know, from the issues you said, and make it a gang crime. The issue to allow wiretapping, even those that, you know, believe in freedom of speech and rights and all that supported that, to be able to use wiretapping. Yeah, because you're basically using the same thing you would use against the Costa Nostra. Right, you know. and gangs yeah. and those kinds. Because, yeah. it, as you know, and we've learned early on, is now a gang issue because right. it's uh, much easier to turn these young girls six, eight, ten times a night than only sell a gun or a right. drug one time and, and not nearly as, as uh, dangerous to do this. On the federal side... Um, one of the issues I know you've been looking at as it relates to the trafficking issue and the movement of across borders between right. states. What, it, what is going on uh, as it relates to that? Well, there's some of the federal legislation that, that we have pushed um, on trafficking assists in this regard, but we also have legislation that uh, attempts to shore up our laws here so that, uh, you know, the rule of law uh, 
you know, the rule of law. We are a, a country of laws, and it's very, very important at the end of the day that uh, sovereignty means, you know, addressing that and issue. I, and I think, too, we've, yeah. we've talked about this in the past, and one of the things we've been able to get through, another bill that's come through here, is what was happening. Let's say a, a girl gets pimped pimped out in Hollywood, then they take right. her to Stockton, then to Visaya, then, you know, within the state. And what was happening is girls would have to go to each court to testify. So what, we're try what we've done is got this legislation that says if we catch the pimp, the girl can testify in one court for all these things. It would be great to have the same kind of legislation, let's say they go from Hollywood to Las Vegas, Las Vegas to San Francisco, back to Vegas, if, if those girls wouldn't have to go to Nevada no. and California. Exactly, and, so, and that's why the federal component's important here, because right. typically what's happening is a girl is getting recruited by one of those Romeo pimps. Right. You know, she's 13, 14, she gets recruited up in Oregon, or she gets recruited in Arizona. He brings her out to California where she has no ties to the family. Uh, from the, the federal nexus of this and taking her over state borders, uh, we can then make sure that right. that criminal gang is put away for good. Well, I really appreciate all your efforts on protecting children. Let's switch gears here a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you and I s uh, share many of the same communities we have over the years. Yeah. Your boundaries have moved more than mine, and you've been moved around a little bit, but we always yeah. have some common ground there to, yeah. to work on. But uh, that's, there's a couple of issues that I know that are extremely important to you and important to me, and that's veterans' issues right. uh, as well as job creation. Let's start with the vets. Uh, everyone knows that you've been an outstanding supporter of the vets. There's been a lot of conversation. Uh, you know, we all work together to try to improve the lives. I mean, these folks put their lives on the line. They're out there right now in harm's way while you and I were sitting here. Uh, but when they come back, they don't get the same kind of treatment they get with the love around them from America when they're we're in the battlefield. What are some of the things that, you know, the issue at the VA hospitals, for example, right. uh, maybe you can give us some insight of what's well, going absolutely. on. Absolutely. There. there we've been able to move bipartisan legislation that does two things. One is to hold those in the VA account, uh, accountable. As you know, the audits are being done right now. Right. So that for the first time they can be fired when they're not doing their job. And second, if, if a veteran is trying to get access to health care there and for some bureaucratic reason they're not seeing him he should be able to go to a doctor outside of the system both those bills we have passed now uh, in our in our law which is an important step you know there's there's so many things we need to be doing for those who are making that sacrifice for the United States and serving uh, another aspect when they come back is what we've been doing in terms of you know the GI Bill expanding that but also just the little things you know you get transferred from base to base you got to you got to cancel your insurance and start up in every in every state. I've got legislation in right now that allows you to take your insurance if you're, you know, serving for the United States uh, to any state, any or any base it's anywhere crazy. in the world. It's crazy. Make it easier for these for these men and women who are serving our country, and make it easier for them when they come back to access and you know the educational opportunities. I mean, I know just the the issue of health care. If they can't yeah. get the services at VA, they should be able. We fight right. that all the time. We said, look at Rancho Los Amigos one of the top rehab hospitals in America. If they can't get the treatment here locally, don't send them to Texas or someplace right. else. We can do it right here. So We finally got that We got that bill through. That is fixed. Good. Because uh, by the way, we're also working uh, on the, uh, you know, with the um, uh, county here on the situation of veterans who have passed away, making right. certain that those remains are properly taken care of. I think we've time. got that. We've. I think we've removed I'm that. I'm working with Janice yeah. on, on a bipartisan legislation. You're... Your office has been very helpful in terms of getting that thing Great. resolved. How, on the job side, obviously the unemployment issue is always important here in Los Angeles County, being the largest county in America, big issue. Uh, what about your initiatives on behalf of small business and yeah. the, the kinds of things? I mean, we know what we can do locally, but there's a lot of issues at the federal level that have an impact. So I'm the number one job creator for us is small business. Some of the things we're trying to do out here, and I'll just, I'll just start with legislation I have with access to credit through credit unions, making it easier for them to do more business loans out here. Another issue is the transportation because businesses have to plan long range. They've got to get their goods to market. So on the 5760 freeway, uh, we had uh, those meetings uh, right. out here with the chairman of the transportation committee. Now with the primary freight network, it, for the first time, we got that legislation in that makes it a... You know, the fact that, the, that we've got goods movement on the 60 and the 57 and on the, um, you know, the Long Beach Freeway makes all of that a primary focus uh, for our projects to expand the lanes. That, frankly, helps businesses down here. Well, as I tell you, everybody comes out of the Alameda Corridor, right? I mean, right. Alameda Corridor is great. Those trains and trucks don't turn left. They turn right. 
and they come out through the rest of it. And coming down the forty percent of America's imports are coming right, through the right in front of my Roland Heights office. The traffic <laughs> stops every day. Uh, the the other aspect of what we're working on is a bill we put into the Senate to try to do something to get the water down here because you know the pumps have been turned off up at the San Joaquin and here we are in the driest year on, in memory. And uh, if we can get the com the competing companion bill out of the Senate. Uh, into conference with this legislation. We need to reach a compromise here for more water storage in Southern California and for turning the San Joaquin pumps on because if you go up right now to the Central Valley, you know, you see the, the fruit rotten on the dead vines, you, you know, you, you see the trees are dying. Agriculture is one of our major exports. Absolutely. It's really hurting us and at the same time it's also water is a business need for businesses down here. So those are some of the areas we're working. And particularly, I mean, I think that would be a great bar bipartisan effort is to turn the faucets back on. I mean, absolutely. Now our, I mean, our, our, uh, our senators are from San Francisco. Yeah, so they, got, they got a little bit of different pic uh, view on the Delta, but we should be able to reach a compromise with them to get this, you know, federal legislation to, uh, you know, get the storage and get the pumps on. What about job training for the jobs of the future? Sometimes it appears that we sort of have a disconnect between the jobs and the education needed to perform those jobs yeah. and causing a lot of imports from other parts of the world to come in and take good American jobs. Oh, I was looking at the forecast here in California, for example, for computer, uh, computer science. Demand's going to be 1.4 million. The actual graduates are going to be 400,000. We need more slots. We need more slots in the engineering schools. Uh, my wife has, you know, taught at Cal Poly and I'm a big enthusiast of their engineering department. The polytechnics need to be able, and the uh, universities here need to expand the hard sciences. I have legislation that I've co-sponsored on this. One of the things we're doing is we're putting compu commu uh, computer sciences in the category of you know, STEM education, science, te technology, engineering, math, and making this a priority. And as we beef up STEM, that's where the high paying jobs are. Absolutely. The other aspect of this is our efforts to recruit and train teachers so that, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, in high school, we're recruiting kids into STEM so that in the university, they get those degrees for the high paying jobs. That'll create more jobs in California, more opportunities. Sounds good. Well, Congressman, uh, you have been an incredible supporter of Los Angeles County, and I speak on behalf of myself. and my colleagues and the 10 million residents and the residents of your district and not only in LA County but the other counties as well to personally thank you for all your efforts on our behalf and look forward to uh, working with you in the future and uh, have a, on your travels just be safe and uh, we look forward to having you back in a little more detail but appreciate you, your time. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for being much. with us. I appreciate it. We'll be back. Thank you again for tuning in to Dialed In. I want to thank my special guest and longtime friend, Congressman Ed Royce, for joining me today. Congressman Royce has been an incredible advocate for veterans and victims of child sex trafficking, and I am very grateful for his friendship personally and professionally over the many years. Whether it is an international, national, or local issue, relationships truly matter in government. Here in Los Angeles County, we are reliant on our representatives in Congress to help us with the many issues at the federal level. We simply can't do it alone. Our residents need to have their representatives at the local, state, and federal level communicating and working together. But thank you for tuning in to another episode of Dialed In. I hope you'll join us next month for an all new show.